everybody. It's me, John Lorden, here with a new episode of Brain Scratch. Happy Friday. Today is August 25th, 2017, and this is one of those episodes where we're going to be looking for space people again. Um, I really like coming back to this topic. I love looking into the history of uh, these stories of abductions. We've got another one. This is from way back in the 60s, a little before Travis Walton, a little bit after Betty and Barney Hill. Um, this is a really interesting one because one of the things that I'm always caught up on uh, when we hear these abduction stories is the credibility of the person. And in this case, we are talking about a police officer. Sound interesting? Let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, starting with the newspaper article here. This is from 1967. U.S. Air Force Project uses doctor to prove cops report of flying saucer by hypnotism. And we can see a little picture of Herb Shermer right down here. Um, that's one of the things I was kind of confused at when I started looking into this. I've seen several articles that are showing this picture is Herb, and then I'm seeing other ones that are saying, no, this guy is Herb. I don't think these are necessarily the same guy. Uh, I have a feeling that someone just picked a old photo of a police officer and jammed it into their blog, and it's been picked up time and time again. Uh, if you guys have information to clear that up for me, please do, because I've been looking at these pictures pretty hard, and I do not think this is the same person from uh, from this photo to this photo. Uh, I have found some good sources that I believe are credible enough to suggest this is actually Herbert Shermer. Um, and outside of that, there's this other guy that pops up occasionally, this guy, who I don't think looks like either of the first two either. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if this is just uh, the fuzziness of the internet collective memory or if I'm living in the Mandela effect, but let's continue. Um, this is the source. This is Omaha UFO study uh, They said that they have original pictures of Herbert Shermer, and these are scans of some of those pictures. So um, I believe that this is more than likely the accurate uh, pictures of him. And down here, we get a shot of close to where the UFO sighting happened. Uh, this happened in Ashland, Nebraska. That is a city in Saunders County, Nebraska in the U.S., and it is a small town. Back in the 1960s, their population was actually less than 2,000 people, uh, just to give you a little insight into where this all went down. So what happened? We're going to start at, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Fortiania, Fortiania, maybe, I, th I think that's a little better, uh, .blogspot.com. They have a write-up on this and have included some photos that uh, Herb himself has uh, drawn about what he saw and what he experienced. At 2 a.m. on a December night in 1967, patrolman Herbert Shermer was making his normal rounds on Highway 6 in Ashland, Nebraska, when he saw lights that he first took to be an oncoming vehicle, but soon became obvious that something else was going on that night. At the junction of Highway 6 and 63, Shermer came upon what he would later describe as UFO that had the appearance of aluminum and was hovering about 10 feet off the ground. The red lights that had earlier attracted Shermer's attention were flashing out of portals around the object. Uh, after watching the object for only a few moments, it started to make what was described as a siren sound, and something like flames shot out from underneath. It began to zoom off into the night sky. I've heard in a couple of, description of descriptions of this story that um, he's saying that flames shot out the bottom of it. Um, I'm a little curious about that just because if you look at um, you know, the ideas that we had for space travel, things that were going on in popular media around then. Um, combustion was kind of the mindset about how people were going to get around in space. Nowadays, you know, uh, ever since uh, Star Trek and warp core engines and things of that nature, I think the thought of combustion uh, isn't quite as popular, but uh, let's continue. Shermer got out of his patrol car with flashlight in hand and began to look around the area where the craft had been hovering. After not finding anything that stood out, Shermer went back to the police station and recorded the following entry in his logbook. Quote, saw a flying saucer at the junction of highways 6 and 63, believe it or not. 
Seeing that it was three o'clock, Shermer figured that he was missing about 30 minutes of time that he could not account for. Now, in other tellings of this story, it's more like 20 minutes, and there's even some debate about how he came to the realization that he was missing time at all when you're talking about a matter of that small of, of 20 minutes. But uh, I would assume for a patrolman, for a police officer, it's very important for them to keep their logbook up to date, and that is primarily the source for where this gap was found. Shermer was brought to Boulder, Colorado, where he was eventually hypnotically regressed by psychologist Dr. Leo Sprinkle. And we're going to hear a whole lot more about that analysis and what the organization was that conducted that analysis as we move forward. But I want to stick with the main story right now. What happened? Moving over to phantomsandmonsters.com. In 1967, he was working the midnight shift in the small town, and a little after midnight noticed a bull had broken loose from an auction barn. The patrolman got the bull back in the pen and then checked on two gas stations nearby. Uh, I made a radio check with Wahoo Sheriff's Office and informed them that all was secure, said Shermer in a report he wrote after the hypnotic sessions. The time was 2.20 a.m. I pulled onto State Highway 6 going west. Then he saw the UFO, first as flashing red lights, then as football-shaped object. Uh, He tried to call the sheriff's office, but his radio was dead. The craft was moving over the highway north, about 40 feet in the air. So a little difference on height now. Uh, It seemed that some great force was pulling the patrol car up the embankment towards where the craft was beginning to land. Uh, I'm not really sure where that information is coming from. I don't see that retold a lot in this story. Shermer saw a red-orange glow on the bottom of the craft and saw a hatch open. It was then that a shape of a man came out and walked over to the front of the patrol car. Then a second man came out of the craft and walked over to the car. The first man stood in front of the patrol car and, holding a small box-like object, pressed something. A green mist came out, spraying all over the patrol car. The other man walked over to the driver's side of the patrol car and, reaching inside, pressed a silver object against my neck, directly under my left ear. I felt a tingling sensation go through my whole body. Now, what's really important about all this information is keep in mind, this is information that came out through his therapy session. His story outside of um, the therapy session is much different. He still recognizes that he saw what he thought was a UFO. He still recognizes that he drove up to it, but then his memory pretty much jumps to he saw it taking off. Um, So all this stuff about him interacting with men, presumably from outer space, this came out through the hypnosis, and then he later learned about that by listening to the tapes of himself, essentially. Uh, It was then that the gray-skinned man addressed Shermer as watchman of the town. The gray-skinned man told Shermer how the craft operated, showed him the power source and computers, and answered questions on the purpose of the craft's visit. One interesting little tidbit about that is the power source that is discussed. um, I believe he called it, let me check here just so that I get it absolutely right, electrically reversible magnetism. Uh, Once again, when I'm thinking of this propulsion type system that he has explained when the craft took off with flames seemingly coming out from under it, uh, if you're talking about some type of electrically magnetic reversible engine, I don't know how that gets to the point of then turning into a combustion system of some kind, but um, anything's possible, right? So what did these aliens tell him? The craft landed to extract power from a nearby hydro transmission line. He said, look, Watchman, I saw a blue bolt of light through a portal. It was like a beam and it hit the transformer on a power pole approximately 200 feet from the craft. There was a bright flash of fire and the blue bolt came back to the craft. Then the man said that one of the reasons they landed was to extract electricity from power stations. Seems like they're stealing energy from a few different ways. Uh, He also said that they have been observing us for a long time. One of the men also told the patrolman that spacecraft would visit him again twice in his lifetime. Quote, 
If I were some kind of kook, I would be saying that I had a visit last week, but it isn't true. I never saw anything again. Under hypnosis, Shermer has drawn detailed sketches of the power plant of the craft, which the spaceman said was based on reversible electromagnetism. Um, pretty much the same thing, but they're changing up the wording just a little bit uh, in this article on that as well. And another point that they didn't mention here are the aliens told him that someday he would see the universe as they do. Uh, just a little point that really stuck with me, but um, this article has, has kind of jumped over. So let's now jump over to abovetopsecret.com and take a look at some more details about the story. In the days following, Shermer started to develop a large red welt on his neck. Now, remember in that previous article where we talked about them uh, touching something to him. Apparently he got a welt. I'm not sure it's exactly in the same area, but I'm assuming that it has something to do with that. Uh, the welt was a few inches long, um, I think up to a half inch wide and did disappear after a few days. He also had constant headaches and he began to feel very ill. Shermer was asked to come to Boulder, Colorado, where he was hypnotized by psychologist Dr. Leo Sprinkle of the University of Wyoming. During the hypnosis session, Shermer claims that after he stopped his car near the object, the engine died and his radio went silent. A second object emerged from inside the craft and seemed to communicate telepathically with him, telling him to resist the urge to pull out his gun. After the session, he was able to recall even more details about the encounter. He describes the beings as friendly. Uh, the beings also supposedly have a base on Venus and draw power from electrical power lines. Um, I've heard Venus or possibly Saturn. I think he actually noted that it was um, a base that they were staying on on Venus or Saturn. So what is this Air Force project that looked into his case and got him together with this doctor for going into regression therapy or regression hypnosis therapy? Uh, let's learn more about all of that. It was in the 1960s that the Air Force decided to hire a university to make an impartial study of UFOs to determine if there was a reason for the Air Force to continue to investigate them. The so-called Condon Committee at the University of Colorado was formed and began their work in 1967, same year that this happened. Uh, what's interesting about this is uh, for some reason I'm seeing people refer to UCLA when they're talking about this. Um, and then in other sources that I believe are a little more trustworthy, I'm seeing that it's University of Colorado. I don't know if there were some UCLA scientists that were participating with the University of Colorado in this. I just wanted to, to note that because I'm, I'm a little confused on who all was part of this uh, Condon committee. In the summary of the report, the Condon Committee investigator wrote, Mr. Shermer felt perhaps he had not been conscious during a period of approximately 20 minutes while he was observing the UFO. He had a feeling of paralysis at the time and felt funny, weak, sick, and nervous when he returned to the police station. They searched the site where Shermer, after hypnosis, would say the UFO had actually landed. They tested for radioactivity, but nothing was found. A polygraph for Shermer was arranged. Uh, the test showed no indications that Shermer was deceptive. Uh, and this is information coming from Kevin Randall at .blogspot.com. Um, this is the only place where I've seen that there was actually a polygraph conducted. There are books about this case, so I'm assuming that some of this information is, is coming out of books as well. Uh, Shermer agreed to take a number of psychological tests. Let's just say that the results tended toward the negative. His IQ, for example, was on the low side for conceptual thinking, but on the high side for dealing with concrete intellectual tasks such as puzzle solving. Um, there's a video that I'm going to refer you guys to at the end of this video um, if you want to learn more about this case. But at the end of that video, there's an analysis where someone is describing Shermer as... Um, not the most educated, even saying that he didn't even complete high school, uh, that I believe he didn't get his diploma until he was after until after he was already working for the police force. Um, so 
it seems to line up with what I'm reading here. Uh, the scientist also noted that he is also preoccupied with seeing UFO objects, but they also noted that he was given the tests after reporting a UFO, and that might account for his obsession at the time. I would certainly think so. I think if you're going to go through something that life-changing, something that would really change your perception um, that hard, that you're probably going to be looking for things to support that evidence moving forward. So I, I think that's a good conclusion uh, that is mentioned here as well. Now, in an aspect of the case that hasn't been discussed much, but one that I find quite disturbing, Sprinkle wrote about a break in the questioning. Uh, and this is during the hypnosis. Sergeant Shermer described some of his reactions to the sighting. He said that he drank two cups of hot steaming coffee, quote, like it was water. He claimed that he often experienced a ringing, numbness, buzzing in his ears before going to sleep around 1.30 or 2 a.m. He believed that he had experienced precognitive dreams. He said he felt concern and hurt since the UFO sighting. He described disturbances in his sleep, including incidents in which he awoke and found that he was choking his wife and handcuffing his wife's ankle and wrist. He said that his wife sometimes woke up during the night and placed his gun elsewhere so that it was not in his boots beside his bed where he had been keeping it. Uh, one of the things that is also noted if you look into this case is he believes that this experience broke up his marriage, essentially ended his marriage. And I have to say, if, uh, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night and your spouse is choking you and they have a gun next to the bed, uh, I would think it probably would be a smart thing to move along from that marriage as well or to seek help, maybe. Um, maybe maybe not the best thing to jump at the first, but who knows what she was going through? Who knows what else was going on in their relationship? Finally, there is the drawing that Shermer made of what the aliens looked like. Here is a point where the contamination might be seen. The alien leader seen here and below uh, and let me get that right. Here is a picture that he drew of what the alien leader looks like. Now, what they're pointing out is these pictures. Um, these pictures are from the aliens in a film called Mars Needs Women, which coincidentally had played in theaters only a few months before the sighting and the regression that he went through. Uh, it's an image that has not been repeated in the UFO literature with any regularity. Uh, I went and found another image here. And in terms of how he described the aliens, he did talk about a silver suit in particular. Um, he did mention the antenna coming up out of where their ears were, uh, how their face would poke through the mask. The only thing missing from his description to this image is he talked about some type of insignia that they had on the left side of their chest that had a serpent with wings on it. Uh, and obviously there is no insignia on this costume, but outside of that, pretty much a dead ringer for what he described and even what he drew himself uh, here. And here you can see he put the insignia uh, he actually put it on the right side of their chest there. But from what I've read, I believe it was supposed to be on the left. I don't know, guys. What do you think? I think it's pretty interesting that the person's face is sticking out of the hood in that way, that you've got what looks almost like a, uh, like a 1980s um, Walkman earpiece or something, and then an antenna coming out of that. That is a pretty darn close match for these photos. Could he have been influenced by pop culture? I am not certain. So what was their conclusion? We jump over to ufocasebook.com. The Condon Committee concluded that evaluation of psychological assessment tests, the lack of any evidence, and interviews with the patrolmen left project staff with no confidence that the troopers reported UFO experience was physically real. Psychologist Dr. Sprinkle, however, felt that Shermer believed in the reality of the events he described. And once again, if he took um, a polygraph test and passed the polygraph, if that aspect is true, then this would certainly be true. Obviously, he would have at least believed in the events or he would know how to fool a polygraph 
Uh, I don't know if that information was as readily available back in the 60s as it is now. Uh, let's take a look at some of the, the pictures that he drew. Uh, here is the football-shaped saucer that he described. Um, we got the alien that we've seen a few times now. Uh, this is another version. This one he didn't draw. This is a sketch by someone named Wes Crum, um, just based on the information that he had given. And here you can see Wes got the logo on the left side, like I had described. Um, here we have another image that he drew. Uh, I just, it's so weird when I look at that, seeing the body like this reminds me of Beavis and Butthead for some reason, um, which definitely was, he was not influenced by back then. Um, but here we do have the badge on the left side. It is correct. One difference between the um, costume from Mars Needs Women and his version is the earpiece is only on one side. So I do think that it's, it's worth noting. Um, we've got two earpieces on this costume and the badge, and he's only got one earpiece on his drawings. So a little bit different. Uh, here is the propulsion unit. Um, he describes that he actually saw the engine room and he describes all these different switches and panels that he didn't understand. Uh, chairs that he said reminded him of dentist chairs, but like much more high end uh, or nicer than dentist chairs. Uh, we can see he even signed this photo here. We see in this room, there's also two big screens. He described that they showed him a map of uh, their home and where he was in relation to that. And I believe that their solar system only had six planets, if I recall correctly. And then he was taken up to a higher level, which uh, here we've got this elevator shaft of some kind. Um, to what I would call the bridge, I guess, where there was a much larger viewing screen, um, more of these kind of high-end dentist chairs and more controls and lights that he couldn't quite describe. So one of the best things about this case is you can listen to his story from his own mouth. And uh, it's a bit different than the Dr. Frank Strange's um, Val Valiant Thor story that we covered that I was highly critical of. Um, the types of storytelling that uh, Dr. Strange's was doing just didn't line up with me in terms of being authentic about a real experience. But uh, in this case, I also get the feeling when I'm listening to this guy that he believes what he's talking about. Uh, you can check it out for yourself. I will have a link to it in the description box below. Um, it's, I think it's pretty rare that we have a piece of media like this, particularly from that time. Now, I believe that this speech happened sometime after. I don't think this speech is directly from 1967. He seems like he's kind of used to speaking to people at this point. So uh, I would assume that it probably came from the mid 70s or something like that. But here you can hear it for yourself from the man, what his experience was like. But once again, keep in mind from the story we're being told, those are not direct memories. Those are memories that came through uh, hypnosis and that he relearned about what he went through. So with all that in mind, uh, I did find this article at xdel.blogspot.com that has a really cool section about the main explanations for those who doubt the reality of alien abductions. And it states that they broadly fall into six categories, dreams, sleep paralysis, false memories, abnormalities in the temporal lobe function, psychosis, and neurosis. Uh, dreams are somewhat self-explanatory since we all do it. However, a few people can enter a state of dreaming while awake and thus produce something called hypnopompic imagery. Because the dreamer is awake and his or her eyes are open, the brain still picks up and processes light as it normally does and translates it into images, which are then superimposed upon the dream. If dreamers of this sort do not know that they are dreaming, then they could easily confuse dream experiences with real ones, since little gray aliens and their abduction habits are now part of our culture and iconography, what they symbolize, strangeness, dominance, forced compliance, etc., can and does show up in dreams. I think that is a really interesting theory because you have him um, working a midnight shift, uh, was that normal for him? 
Was his shift changing regularly? So his sleep patterns were being affected. Is it possible that he was exhausted on this particular day from something else that had happened earlier in the day? Um, I don't know. I really wish that we had a lot more detail about his day leading up to this so that we could possibly put some more stock in that. Um, but knowing that he himself explained that he believed he was having uh, precognitive dreams, uh, I believe he was probably feeling like he was having deja vu about some situations over and over again. Um, he definitely noted having sleep problems after this experience, which is not uncommon for these um, experiences, but was he having sleep problems possibly leading up to this or possibly even before that? Could that be contributing to this type of waking dream situation happening? I think it's something we really have to consider. Uh, sleep paralysis. Upon waking, the sleeper's mind becomes conscious before the body has a chance to get into the awake mode. This results in momentary paralysis lasting a second or two. Uh, the above researchers and others strongly suspect that sleep paralysis can also trigger hallucinatory episodes lasting only a brief period of time. That one doesn't really sound like it fits this particular situation very well. You're talking about only a few seconds that you are paralyzed. Um, and then even if you are triggering a hallucination, it's a brief hallucination. Uh, what he has described, we're looking at a, you know, 20 minutes of activity going on there. I just, I don't know that that explanation really fits well for me. Um, sleep paralysis occurs most often in people who suffer from narcolepsy or other disorders. Even believers note that a significant percentage of abductee claimants suffers from some type of sleep disorder. Uh, once again, my question is, were they suffering from that before the experience or is it as a result of the experience? Psychosis does not play a large role in the debunking of alien abduction claims, although both believers and non-believers accept the probability that such is the most likely explanation in some cases. Once again, because of the prevalence of UFO symbology in our media sphere, those suffering from schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder could very well incorporate alien items into their delusions. Um, one thing about this story is the information that he's relaying in terms of what he sees on the ship and of what the aliens look like. Uh, of what the ship looks like, that it looks like it's made out of aluminum, that there's flames coming out of the bottom of it. All of it seems very reminiscent to me of a sci-fi movie, particularly from those days. Look at Flash Gordon's spaceship. Uh, I mean, literally, it's, it, it's shaped like an aluminum football with flames coming out the back of it. So it's one of those things where when I, when I listen to stories like this and I'm looking at information like this, I really want details that surprise me, that, that really make me think twice about the information that's being presented. Um, one of those things in this case is the electrically reversible magnetism engine that he described. And one of the things that gave me a little bit of an interesting turn when I was researching this uh, was I started looking at, at magnetic motors and based on his description, he talked about being in this room where there was these cylinders that were about four feet tall. They were all arranged in a circle and there was this object in the middle. I think he also said this object was shaped like a football, if I remember correctly, that was spinning. And I bumped into this photo, uh, which is a guy on YouTube that is playing with magnets trying to make a motor out of them. And it was just the description that he had given me really seemed to match this fairly well. Um, on top of that, I thought, well, why don't I take a look at electromagnetic motors just to see could he have been influenced by those as well. Uh, here, once again, we get, and it's interesting because in his explanation, he talks about r wires running through them. So if we look at this one, uh, which is admittedly up on his si on its side, that's not what he described. He described a round room where those were around him essentially, but uh, look at what we have here. This is Wheatstone's eccentric ring type electromagnetic engine from 1841. So there was certainly designs that were in place 
um, specifically that he could have been exposed to. Uh, I'm sure there's been movie props based on this, actually. And even outside of that, look at modern design, you know, the arc reactor from Iron Man. Uh, so it's not that it's that unique of a design, but for him describing that it was in the engine room, uh, for them telling him specifically that it was this type of energy is somewhat interesting. And there is information to support um, electromagnetic propulsion. We've got a Wikipedia article on it. And in particular, the exact term that he mentioned, electrically reversible magnetism, I found this article just from February 2017, talking about a new technology that is a step towards improving the storage and retrieval of information on hard drives, which is basically able to make non-magnetic material magnetic and then thrash it and recreate it back and forth so that it could store information. So. Um, for him to kick out that term back then, is it impossible? Is it is it telling of the future in some way? I don't know. I think that term was probably around, but a guy that didn't finish high school, 22 years old, how much time would he have had? I mean, was he an engineer on the side or did he at least have fun um, taking maybe working on cars, you know, maybe if he took an alternator apart, he would get to see a design that would kind of remind you of that. I just, I don't know. I wonder how he would be influenced specifically for this type of engine. But then I also wonder if he's describing this type of engine, why is he talking about flames shooting out the bottom of the craft? Because I don't think that this type of technology would produce a combustion engine type response like that. So... Um, back to above top secret, they kind of summed it up at one point um, in a reply to someone's post. There is a much simpler explanation that fits the facts. The contactees are making it all up. And of course, that kind of sounds like just the skeptic's point of view on this. Uh, in this particular case, I don't know that this is being made up. If the lie detector thing is true, um, I believe that there was some experience that happened to him that he perceived this as happening. So then it's just a question of, uh, was he going through some type of event, of event? Was he having this type of waking dream situation that we had talked about or something else that was going on with him psychologically or physiologically that was causing him to see things like this? Uh, was he being hoaxed? Did someone really build something out there? Um, you know, we've seen examples of people hoaxing each other by building objects. Um, but really, my gut is leaning towards the waking dream thing. I think just considering he's in a town of 2,000 people, patrols in the middle of the night in an area like that. I mean, look, he stopped because a cow or a, a bull got out of his pen and, and he went and put the bull back in. It's probably a fairly mundane job. There's probably not a whole lot going on in that job. And is it possible that he kind of fell half asleep and saw these strange occurrences? I think it's possible. Uh, is it possible that something happened to him? I still think that's possible as well. Now, I did have a question about hypnosis after looking into this. And there was like this assumption because they kept referring back to his regression uh, hypnosis. There's this assumption that for some reason, if you're hypnotized, that you have to tell the truth. And I don't know if that is factually true or not. So I just did a very quick Google search. I've only looked at several blurbs on this, but I was wondering, can you lie under hypnosis? Why is there this default assumption that, well, they were hypnotized, they have to tell the truth? Uh, and most of the blurbs, there's a little debate, but most of them seem to echo what this top result does. You can lie under hypnosis just as easily as in the waking state. In fact, as hypnosis gives you greater access to unconscious resources, you may even be able to tell more creative lies when in trance. Just something to keep in mind, particularly because so much of his more fantastic information came out when he was under hypnosis. And even if he did create that while he was under hypnosis, um, I believe that that would put it in 
terms of believability for him that he could pass a lie detector if that information was challenged. Uh, like I mentioned before, I will have a link to, there's a few different videos, but this one has all of the interviews all in one place and there's not a bunch of commercials strung through the middle of it. So this is the best link that I found for his interview. I will have this in the description box below. But what's really interesting is not only is his interview here, but we have a comment from Jake Shermer. This is my great uncle. He was always sane and never did any type of drugs. He was a good man. If any of you think this isn't true, you don't have an open mind and don't understand the universe. Now, it seems like he's talking about him in past tense. I did find an obituary for Herbert Shermer. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this is the right person. The age totally matches up. Uh, this guy has experience in the Navy as well. Uh, he did die in Atlanta, um, but the, from the relatives I'm seeing here, they do mention Wahoo, Nebraska as well. So I'm fairly confident that this is him. Unfortunately, he died just in March of 2017, uh, fairly recently. So I really wish uh, we could have asked these questions directly to him. I didn't find a lot of current media. It didn't seem like he was the type of person that was trying to take this story and make it more or make it a career path for him or something like that. As a matter of fact, the obituary says that he wound up being a retired security guard um, for a security services company, which, of course, if he was former law enforcement, it would kind of make sense that he might go to that after uh, he had such trouble with law enforcement. Actually, I didn't. I didn't really get to mention that earlier, but um, people in town, once they heard about his story, uh, he was catching a lot of flack for it. Uh, there's a story that he says, and it's weird because I see this kind of misreported by people that retell it. Um, some people retell it saying that his police car was blown up by dynamite. Uh, he himself states that his car was blown up by dynamite, but that he had just finished paying it off. So I believe that's his personal car. I don't think that's the same car that was possibly interacted with, with these aliens. Um, but there was a lot of bad stuff. I mentioned, you know, his marriage went south. Uh, they did promote him to police chief because his chief retired. And uh, he talks about situations where he's pulling someone over, trying to write them a ticket. They're laughing at him, tearing up the ticket and driving off. He actually gave up the job after only being police chief for two months. So... It's one of those things, if he is really lying about this, this was a lie that took a lot away from him in terms of where his life was before this. And I don't see a pattern of him trying to monetize this lie in some way going forward. Yes, there were a couple of books written. I'm sure maybe he got a little bit of money from that. Seems like he did a few speeches. But like I said, I couldn't find anything that was very current in terms of uh, speeches that he had given or appearances that he was making. And we know that there is a community for that out there, obviously, because we just went through a bunch of uh, different websites here in today's episode of people that I'm sure would have loved to interview uh, Herbert and they could have, uh, if, if he was available for that. So I just, I really have trouble thinking that this was a guy that was just lying. I don't, I don't think that that's possible. Uh, was he possibly in this waking dreaming state Was something else going on with him? Maybe, uh, was there something outside of that? Maybe. It's honestly one of the more compelling stories that I've bumped into in terms of these types of experiences. And uh, like I mentioned, I'm going to have that link down below. Listen to him tell it for himself. Listen to him tell you the story of his abduction. And then come, come back here, hit the comment section, and let me know what you think about this. Thank you so much, Brain Scratchers. I really love that I get to do episodes like this. Um, you know, sometimes things get heavy and I mentioned I have to do a fringe episode to kind of lighten the mood on the channel a little bit. But outside of that, I'm just genuinely interested in these types of stories. Uh, I hope that I never run out of them to look into. I'm always going to look at them critically minded, but uh, I am open to these experiences, these possibilities. And I'm hoping someday that the proof is, is really there to blow us all away. 
and I'm, I'm hopeful it's coming. I'll keep my fingers crossed and I'll keep my camera running. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here on Monday on the Lord and Arts channel.